Hello and welcome to AM Medical's virtual summit and this afternoon's InnoZone session, 3D printed PEC polymer, enabling a family of medical devices that inhibit bacterial growth without the use of antibiotics. Brought to you by our sponsor, Oxford Performance Materials. My name is Israr Kabir. I'm with ASME's industry events team and I will be moderating our session today. I am joined by our speaker, Thomas Webster, uh, chair and professor at Northeastern University, as well as James Partreas, Director of Engineering from Oxford Performance Materials. Before we get started with the presentation, let's quickly discuss a few housekeeping items. All sessions are being recorded and access will be provided to you within the next few days. Submit, uh, to submit a question, simply use the send message box in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. For live technical support or question related to today's summit, click on the contact AM medical box in the bottom left corner and type in your question. Our team is waiting to assist. And if for any reason you have any problems viewing uh, the presentation on the actual uh, virtual platform, the Zoom link will be provided to you within the chat box. So please just use that link to access uh, the Zoom feed. And with that, James, please take it away. Great, thank you very much. Um, so good afternoon and welcome to OPM's InnoZone, uh, 3D printed PEC medical devices and their antibacterial characteristics. Uh, my name is James Porteous, Director of Engineering at Oxford Performance Materials. And as said, I'm joined today by Dr. Thomas Webster of Northeastern University, uh, who has been a valuable research collaborator for us. And he will be discussing a little bit later the results of our antibacterial studies. Uh, I'm gonna try to give a lot of background in like five minutes. Um, it's a pretty limited time. Um, so I'm gonna go through some slides pretty quickly, but. Feel free to ask questions at the end, and uh, also please stop by our booth um, to get more information. So a little bit about our company. Oxford Performance Materials was founded in 2000 uh, with a focus on developing technologies and manufacturing methods for the polymer polyether ketone ketone or PEC. Um, we are a medical device OEM and contract manufacturer. We are ISO 1345 certified, FDA registered, all the fun stuff, um, and we maintain a 34,000 square feet facility in Connecticut, USA, as well as a subsidiary in Tokyo, Japan. We currently maintain six FDA 510K clearances. Um, we were the first company to receive FDA clearance for 3D printed polymeric implants, um, so they do exist. Um, you can see here four of the main categories. Um, so we manufacture patient-specific cranial devices, patient-specific facial devices, um, a spine fab vertebral body replacement device, as well as a suture anchor system for rotator cuff repair. So these are all 3D printed with PEC polymer. Um, it's what we term the osteofab technology. And just a little bit about PEC. Um, just wanna point out off the bat that it's not peak. Uh, it's in the same polymer family as PEAK. They're both polyketones, um, but it's both somewhat similar, but also very different. Um, in fact, uh, some of the uh, end use applications are quite different with PEC versus PEAK. Um, so it's a high performance polymer, similar to PEAK. It has similar mechanical properties to cortical bone, um, with much more closely matched in elastic modulus to cortical bone, um, so pretty, big difference from metallic implants uh, in that area. As you would expect, it's fully biocompatible. Um, so at OPM, we've done all the testing internally to show that um, PEC is suitable for use in long-term implant applications. And finally, uh, PEC uh, displays some pretty significant adhesion and wetting characteristics. Um, pretty different from most polymers and um, it's really the basis for being able to 3D print PEC in a layer by layer powder process. So a little bit about the process, osteofab technology. Um, it's basically our term for the laser centering or laser melting of PEC powder. Um, so if you're familiar with the laser centering process, um, we basically take a CAD model, um, divide it into submillimeter 2D cross sections, and then create a part slowly by successively melting layers of powder uh, in the print bed until that part is built up in three-dimensional space. Um, unlike the metal-based processes, there's no supports needed. Uh, when the parts are finished, they're allowed to cool 
and they are pretty much suspended in the uncentered powder in the bed. Our general process is uh, just digital build layout, uploaded to the printer. The printer does its thing. The parts get excavated from the powder bed. Um, they're inspected however they need to be and then shipped to wherever they need to go. Uh, we don't do any sterilization in-house. They are autoclavable at the healthcare facility if needed. Uh, one of the uh, most important properties of devices made through this process is the surface. Um, the surface structure itself is enabling a lot of functional properties um, and it's basically uh, a roughened skin type surface that has a peak and pit topography. Um, this topography contains nano rough surface characteristics. Um, it doesn't affect the bulk of the part. The part is still solid. You can see from the cross section here um, that there's a solid part with a rough skin on the ends. Uh, but this is enabling functional properties such as bone on growth and antibacterial characteristics. So just a little bit on bone on growth. Um, we've done some studies internally uh, and some customers of ours has, have also repeated these studies, um, but we've shown that 3D printed PEC is amenable to bone integration um, and basically on growth and in growth into the peak and pit like surface. Um, so this is some examples of an internal study that we performed cross sections of an implant um, in a rabbit model in the medullary canal um, at eight week and 12 week time points versus peak. And you can see the difference here, um, that pink bone just really growing up to and onto the surface and integrating in all those peaks and pits versus the typical peak response on the bottom left of a fibrous encapsulation and no real integration. Similar follow-up study looked at, okay, we see that we have integration and attachment to the surface, but really how uh, what's the quality of that bone and what's the quality of the integration there? So a follow-up study was done um, with some push-out testing and the, those results are here, uh, at least qualitatively. But you can see really um, that bone is really integrated to the pec rod on the right, um, pulled right out when, it was, when the rod was pulled out versus again, kind of the typical non-attachment to smooth peak, um, some attachment to the titanium coated rod on the left um, but there again, some also delamination of the coating, which is uh, an inherent risk with those types of devices. So with that, I will leave it to Tom to present some of the bacteria inhibition studies that we've been working on. Um, as I mentioned, whoops, we uh, were able to do some great work with him over the past few months and uh, I'll leave it to Tom. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, if you could hand over the sharing of the screen. Sure. Thank you. And that was a, uh, a wonderful introduction for PEC um, that we have been studying and collaborating with Oxford for, I don't know, about a year now, really to look at bacteria properties. You heard a lot about great bone growth properties of PEC, but I want to tell you a little bit about what we're finding in terms of bacteria inhibition. So just as a small background um, in my career, nothing like breaking your 20 year career down to one slide, <laughs> but we have spent a lot of time looking at nanostructured surfaces for orthopedics, for vascular applications, for antibacterial applications, really a wide range of medical device um, situations. And what we're finding, you can see on this slide some examples, but what we're finding is nanotextures are a great thing. If you can create them appropriately, uh, you have a process that can create them, you have a material that can have nanostructured features. We're seeing properties like increased bone growth on 3D printed metals when we collaborate with, co with companies for amputee type applications, some images there in the upper right of this slide, we're seeing improved wound healing when we create nanostructured features on things like titanium abutments used for amputees, even things like catheters at the very bottom, we're seeing antibacterial properties when you create appropriate nanoscale features. So we're seeing really a great ability to control cell function, whether it's decreasing bacteria, decreasing inflammation, or promoting tissue growth just using nanotextures without drugs. But really, I want to concentrate on PEC 
here and some of the exciting things that we're finding out. I think as we all know, in the uh, bacteria community, we have a real problem that is coming up. It actually is already present in terms of antibiotic resistant bacteria. In fact, one of the specific examples that I like to give is uh, a prediction from the Centers for Disease Control, which has predicted that more people will die from antibiotic resistant bacteria than all cancers combined by 2050. So we are very interested in working with companies like Oxford who have a nanostructured surface to see if we can decrease bacteria function without using an antibiotic, without contributing to this problem that is down the road for antibiotic resistant bacteria. So we did a number of in vitro results, both to see what the bacteria response is to PEC, as well as to understand a mechanism of action. Obviously, we're not using antibiotics. So there, there must be a mechanism that we can explore for why uh, PEC is behaving the way it is. So following very standard colony forming unit assays, we've looked at a number of different bacteria. We've looked at Staphylococcus epidermidis, which is shown here. This is the bacteria that's on your skin. Easily infects wounds during orthopedic surgery. It comes with you to the surgical suite, so there's no way to remove it. And what we're seeing, obviously, is comparing to titanium or a peak that we have significantly decreased numbers of colony forming units on PEC. PEC is here in the yellow, and this is just after one day. So a very quick culture time, we're seeing this significant decrease in bacteria colonization on PEC. What is further intriguing to us is it doesn't seem to matter the type of bacteria that we're culturing on PEC samples. So this is an example for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. We call to, often call this pseudo. <laughs> so Pseudomonas aeruginosa, same trend. In the yellow bars, again, that's PEC. You can see a significantly decreased colonization after just one day compared to peak and titanium. And of course, the one that we love to study in my lab is MRSA. MRSA is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aurorus. This is the antibiotic resistant form of Staphylococcus aurorus. So you cannot use the antibiotic uh, methicillin to kill this bacteria if it colonizes your orthopedic implant or any medical device. And again, here we're seeing a significantly decreased colonization on PEC compared to peak and titanium. Now, the other interesting thing is we have assays in the lab that can look at the number of live versus dead cells. It's another way to assess materials for antibacterial properties, same color scheme, and what we're seeing after the same period of time, whether we look at Staphylococcus epidermidis or any of these we're talking about is a lower number of live cells. So even though I just showed you graphs of the decreased number of cells, on the surface of PEC, of those cells, a significantly lower number are alive. So it actually you know, makes for an interesting um, thing to study, is of those that are attaching, a significantly less amount are alive. In fact, 50% at some time points on PEC, whereas we're seeing you know, close to 90% of Staphylococcus epidermidis alive after attaching onto titanium or PEC. Same thing for Pseudomonas aeruginosa here. We're seeing you know, 50%, 60% of the bacteria alive. Again, significantly less numbers, but of those that attached, significantly less are alive on PEC compared to titanium and PEAK. And the same thing for MRSA. When we stain for live dead um, assay, we're seeing significantly reduced number of MRSA that are alive on PEC compared to PEAK or titanium. So summary, quick summary before I go into a very brief discussion of why we think this is happening, is the results of in, our in vitro work have really shown decreased bacteria colonization for gram positive or gram negative or antibiotic resistant bacteria on PEC compared to PEC and titanium. And of those smaller numbers that attached, less are alive. So we're seeing decreased number of living cells of those that attached on PEC 
compared to titanium and peak. And impressively, if, if you were following close attention, you would see that MRSA actually showed the best inhibition on PEC compared to the three bacteria that I showed with you. In other words, there were the least number of adherent MRSA compared to Staphylococcus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So let me briefly talk about why we think this is going on. And of course, you can ask why until you're, you're as blue as the slide that I'm showing you. But here's some thoughts why we think PEC is working the way that it is, improving bacteria inhibition. Many of you may know, if you start at the upper left part of this slide, that nano features are all over nature. So nano features are on leaves, they're on insect wings, they're really on a number of things that have evolved to control surface energy. So if you look at, again, something as simple as a cicada or a locust, and you look very high magnification at the wing of that insect, you will see nano features, very discrete nano features, discrete spacing at the nanometer level, discrete heights. Those features provide that insect with antibacterial properties. I might also add, we're finding out that they're antiviral properties too. So in light of this COVID-19 situation, we're asking ourselves the question, can these features also decrease virus adsorption and activation on medical device surfaces? But what the other thing that we have done is we've modeled these interactions. So on the right, you can see that big red bacteria. This is your MRSA trying to attach to a surface that has nano features. Our computational models really show that as the bacteria is trying to attach, it spreads its membrane so much that it either can't attach or these little nano features poke the membrane. And that can lead to inhibition of attachment or death in some cases in our models. Now in our experiments, if you go to the middle of the slide, slightly to the left, you will see other samples. This is not PEC. These are other samples in which we have created nanostructured features that are micron and nano structured. Now, if you look at the AF, these are AFM images. If you look at the D micrograph, this is a picture or a description of how proteins adsorb to micron surfaces versus nano surfaces. And this protein in particular that we're studying is fibronectin. Fibronectin is a wonderful protein that can promote bone growth, promote bone cell attachment, and reduce bacteria attachment. So what we're seeing is when fibronectin adsorbs to the micron surface in D, you basically see these blobs that are on the surface. Those blobs are fibronectin, and it's absorbing in a non-bioactive state. But when we create nano features out of that same polymer, again, looking under nano, the letter D image, you see the fibronectin begins to spread, and it looks more fibrillar, more like fibers. Those fibers are more bioactive. So not only are we creating these features that can change how a bacteria membrane attaches or not attaches, but we're changing the energy of the surface. And changing the energy of the surface changes what proteins absorb and how they absorb. These proteins are nanostructured. So we're really interested in exploring these nano features to alter those protein interactions to reduce bacteria attachment. And you'll see at the very bottom, of course, I don't have time for this, but we've actually created an equation this equation can predict what size nanoscale feature you should put on your medical device to in turn give you the energy to manipulate these protein interactions that could reduce bacteria attachment. So real quick, that's what we did on the PEC samples from Oxford, is we measured surface energy. You can see on this slide that compared to titanium, compared to peak, we actually created or, or looked at the surface energy of PEC and found that it had closer surface energy to three key proteins in your body that are known to reduce bacteria colonization. So mucin is in your saliva, lubricin, casein, these are all natural proteins in your body fluids that have antibacterial properties. So what we found was that PEC was able to have a surface energy similar 
to these proteins, and in turn, it enhanced the absorption of these antibacterial proteins naturally in your body. So here's some of the results. If you're familiar with ELISA assays, this is just one way to determine protein absorption on your surface. You can see PEC had a six times increase absorption of, of a protein called casein from bodily fluids. Again, casein is known to reduce bacteria absorption. When you can look at mucin, mucin again, another key antibacterial protein in your body, we saw four, eight times increase absorption of mucin on PEC compared to PEC or titanium. Lubricin, lubricin of course was invented, or not invented, <laughs> but named because it is a lubricant protein in your joints. Well, it also has antibacterial properties. And we saw three times the increased absorption of lubricin on PEC compared to PEC in titanium. So clearly, PEC has the energy, the surface energy, to increase the absorption of these key proteins known to inhibit bacteria. So of course, the last thing I want to share with you is we need to correlate, we needed to correlate that absorption of these proteins to reduce bacteria attachment on PEC. If these proteins are so important for reducing bacteria absorption, if we pre-coat titanium, PEC, and PEC with these proteins, we should see an inhibition of bacteria. So we're really correlating this increased absorption of casein, mucin, lubricin to a decrease in bacteria absorption to kind of close the circle in this mechanism. And indeed, that's what we found. So PEC increased the absorption of casein that I showed you, which in turn, when we pre-absorbed casein onto PEC, we saw the greatest inhibition of Staphylococcus epidermidis, looking at colony forming units. Again, looking at Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we found that that increased absorption of casein decreased. Pseudomonas aeruginosa on PEC did not do it on PEC or titanium. And lastly, for MRSA. MRSA, when we absorbed, pre-absorbed casein on PEC, we were able to correlate the increased absorption to decreased MRSA colonization. And I'm not going to show you all the other bacteria and all the other proteins that we looked at, but we're seeing that same mechanism as, as, you know, come through. In other words, PEC has the appropriate nanoscale roughness, has the appropriate surface energy to absorb endogenously or from your body these at least three proteins, mucin, casein, and lubricin, which in turn are inhibiting bacteria attachment. And again, the key thing in all of this to me, and the reason why I get so excited about this material, is it's doing it without an antibiotic and not contributing to the antibiotic resistant problem that we have. So I think, Jim, I'll, I'll hand it back over to you, maybe for your, your quick announcement about your exhibit booth. Yeah, just quickly, um, feel free for, you know, there's tons of information and in, uh, an army of people in our booth, um, you know, willing to answer any kind of questions people may have. Um, thanks again to you, Tom. Uh, that was that was excellent. Um, you know, we started this work before all this um, COVID stuff came about. Um, but, you know, as we've gone through this environment and all these changes, we're really seeing how important it's becoming and uh, certainly important to continue. So thank you very much, everybody, for your time. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you, Dr. Webster, for this very insightful presentation. Uh, I find it uh, continuously fascinating how 3D printing can sort of uh, mimic what's happening in nature and sort of take advantage of these design properties that are not possible through other uh, manufacturing means. So we did have a couple of questions, and um, uh, perhaps we can sort of jump jump to those real quick. Uh, sort of one of the first questions, and this is sort of one that I was even thinking about as I was reading it, so it was, can the antibacterial property of PEC be exploited only by 3D printing, I'm sorry, PEC, or be, uh, be exploited by only by 3D printing, or is PEC inherently antibacterial? So is it a process thing, or is the material itself antibacterial? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and, and Jim, I can jump right in. <laughs> so, sure. you know, obviously, we didn't have time to share all of the data that um, we have for, for PEC for these materials, but we have with Oxford looked at different versions of PEC. And every time we are seeing this reduced bacteria colonization. So it might be a little bit tough to make a concrete statement right now, but it does look like the, the chemistry of PEC, in addition 
to these nanostructured features that Jim talked about, you know, this could be a, a property of PEC. You know, I, I would say one more thing that, you know, if, if the PEC chemistry is so unique at reducing bacteria colonization by creating nanostructured features on it, you're actually in increasing the surface area of that chemistry. So you're increasing the surface area of an antibacterial chemistry or a bacteriostatic chemistry. So, you know, we haven't extensively studied this, but it does look like there's something special about the PEC chemistry independent of its nanoscale features. Yeah. All right, now the next question. Uh, are there any particular types of medical device applications that are best suited for, for PEC? Um, yeah, I can take this one. So, I mean, what the space that we've been in so far is, um, you know, kind of uh, anywhere that we're replacing bone. Um, so certainly we have our, you know, patient-specific cranial and facial devices. Those are meant to fill bony voids in the cranial uh, or facial skeleton. Um, we do some contract manufacturing um, in the spinal uh, industry. Um, so we provide some inner body devices for that application. Um, we've developed uh, a suture anchor system, so for use in sports medicine applications, uh, rotator cuff repair, as I mentioned before. Um, so really anywhere that you need kind of, uh, you know, uh, a material that has good mechanical performance and strength um, and can hold up to some, you know, load-bearing forces in the body. Um, that's where we've been, uh, kind of the space that we've been sitting in so far. Um, we do have, uh, you know, further development ideas that we're kind of working on, things in R&D, other parts of the body that we plan to go into, um, you know, but they're all pretty much centered around bone application right now. Actually, this, this question I think is a, a good segue to which is your response here. So what are some strategies that can be used to design PEC implants to enhance bone integration? It might in itself might be a very uh, deep topic, but <laughs> are there any sort of top level uh, com comments that you can now. make? Yeah, um, well, I mean, to start off, you know, 3D printed PEC inherently will give you that bone on growth property and potential for integration. Um, you know, we kind of talk about best of both worlds type of, of viewpoint where you get that integration that you normally get from a titanium type device, um, you know, and not the drawbacks of encapsulation and potential rejection that we're seeing a lot with uh, smooth peak devices. Um, so just by using that material, I mean, you're already getting off on that foot. Um, and certainly there's some design um, strategies and things that you can do. I mean, we're, you know, 3D printing kind of the sky's the limit in terms of design and, and you know, complexity. Um, so we can print things like lattice structures and meshes and kind of things that are designed to guide, you know, bone travel through uh, maybe a channel or something like that. So there's certainly, um, you know, there's a, probably a myriad of different things that you could do from a design perspective. Um, you know, but it's that kind of combination of the material with the process that's really enabling that property. Yeah, I can, I can add a little bit, Jim, to, to that question too. So, you know, although we, again, we haven't heavily investigated this, but we are seeing indications that these would be excellent three-dimensional porous materials. And the reason I say that is we've looked a lot at three-dimensional materials in my career and oftentimes if bacteria get in the middle of some of these pores in the inside of the porous structure they create their own environment and it really is ripe for an infection because mm -hmm. you you really have a lack of new cells coming in you have a lack of your immune system to clear those bacteria so that kind of micro colony that forms grows uninhibited so if you have a structure and a material that can be the inside of those pores, like PEC that has nano features, you could keep bacteria from colonizing the inside and getting an infection on the middle of these three-dimensional surfaces. And conversely, if these three-dimensional structures and, and PEC can improve bone growth, then you can really get a good bone ingrowth in the middle of these porous structures that provides for obviously great mechanical interlock. Great, okay. And I think uh, we'll wrap things up with this uh, one question pertaining to our friends at the FDA. The question is, what general guidance or wisdom can you offer for navigating FDA with nanosurface products? 
especially with MOA related to nano features based on your experience uh, or per the issued guidance documents? Um, well, I mean, I'll, I guess I'll say, uh, you know, we haven't um, made any kind of claims or anything regulatory wise in terms of, uh, you know, any kind of these properties, at least any bacterial uh, or nano nanostructured features. I mean, that, that kind of work is in progress, but I mean, you know, it's kind of like any other regulatory claim that you want to make. You need to do the, you know, research and provide the science and, and show that really there is something there. Um, certainly before you, you know, make that kind of claim publicly. Um, you know, FDA has a lot of resources on their website. Um, historically better to Google FDA and then whatever search term you want versus looking through their website because it's a little hard to navigate. Um, but they, you know, the technical considerations guidance document that they released for additive manufacturing is pretty good. Um, we actually had some input into that um, at the workshop that they conducted back in 2014. Um, so there's there's a, a lot of resources. I mean, there you know it's sometimes hard to decipher what they mean, but they're very responsive to questions, and um, you know we haven't been shy in, in kind of consulting their their thoughts. So, so I, I, I was, sorry, go ahead. Dr. Yeah, I was just going to say real real quick. I know we're we're coming up on the end of our time, but I do you know would love to commend Oxford for their interests right in looking at a mechanism of action. You know, I, I think that that is critical when thinking about regulatory approval is that there is data and, and you know, Oxford drove this, right? At, that they're interested and want to know what is the mechanism by which bacteria colonization is reduced. So, you know, that doesn't happen all the time, an interest in mechanism, but I think that should go a long way with a regulatory approval strategy, this unique surface energy that can increase absorption of key proteins in your body to reduce bacteria colonization.